this book with a book um, by Marsha Dean Phelps about yes. American oh. Beach, someone who oh lived that history herself. Russ Reimer was a journalist. He was not from Jacksonville. He wasn't from Florida. But I remember reading this book, and he wrote something that almost captured the way I felt about my city's history and my lack of awareness and even lack of appreciation for it. In American Beach, which is about the black community in Jacksonville that established American Beach in Nassau County, this is what Russ Reimer said. He spent a lot of time in Jacksonville in the late 1990s. No one has ever accused Jacksonville, Florida of putting on airs. It is in the 1990s, one of the South's least graceful cities. <laughs> its sparse outcropping of corporate skyscrapers, surrounded by an unrestrained, generic urban sprawl, gives the impression of salted earth, a desiccated soil in which nothing sophisticated or genteel can thrive. Even Jacksonvillians, especially Jacksonvillians, consider their home a backwater, enough of one at least to require defending against the charge. 180 years after its first settling, Jacksonville still seems a rambling squatter's camp, awaiting its charter empty of mission bereft of history. Wow. This was pretty blunt. <laughs> <laughs> and, as he suggested, there was an element of truth there. So I remember reading that and saying, he's, he's read my mind. This is what I felt. And I knew, though, that that couldn't be true. Of course, it's, we're not bereft of history, but perception that we are a community, an area bereft of history, is true. And so the question for me became, why is that the case? Why is that the perception? Because it's patently false, but there is an element of truth here. And so, well, then you begin to wonder, well, who's to blame for that? Is it the city itself? We have remarkable historians in the city, both professional and amateur at the local level. It can't be that. Um, I would oftentimes, and I do this today, whenever there are big books about American history on huge topics, such as the indigenous history of America, or the Civil War in America, or the Civil Rights Movement, I will oftentimes go back and look, does Jacksonville make an appearance? Never. Not, not in big comprehensive books about the Civil War or the Civil Rights Movement, but even in books about indigenous America. There have been two recently published in the last year, massive works, the Temuco earn one line and one paragraph. And so I think in some way that this is a multifaceted problem, but at its root, I would argue, it has to do with education at a really fundamental level, beginning with secondary, student, secondary school students and moving up to college. We have not taught and communicated our history well to our youth. And so we see this course as one way to begin to change that narrative, because one of the things students continually are telling us, they are astounded by what they learn about Jacksonville history. What many of you who are very knowledgeable about Jacksonville history and Northeast Florida history um, would take for granted as common knowledge, our students do not know. And it's just kind of oftentimes um, a little bit unsettling how little they know, not only about Jacksonville history, but at times American history as well. So this is important about changing what Russ Reimer viewed as Jacksonville's reputation and identity. Um, but we are, of course, not only a city where residents oftentimes don't know its history, we are a city of newcomers. And ever more so are we a city of newcomers and migrants, particularly here at the beach. And having a way for newcomers, of course, institutions like the Beaches Museum, like the Jacksonville Historical Society, like the Ritz Theater, um, the Clara White Mission, there are many museums and public history institutions that do a really good job of telling our history. But I feel like what a course will do differently is provide a kind of common foundation. Um, oftentimes, many of my students are brand new to Jacksonville, or brand new to the United States. They know nothing about where they are now living. And so offering this course can begin to kind of provide a common foundation in which we as a community, despite our vast differences, can kind of find a common language to talk about a past that shapes all of us. All right, so what are the goals for this course? I'm going to talk about three here tonight. And I want to start 
off, and I get this guy hit this button a little bit harder, and it will. No, I skipped over. I'm not going to tempt fate. Let me just say <laughs> that that was the circles of Hierocles, how our identities are shaped. Um, I oftentimes tell my students this, um, you know, you are your own individual self, and you are then surrounded by a family. And we all want to know, we hope, our family's history, and then surrounded by the family's history is your community, your community shapes your identity, and then there's the nation, and then there's the world. My point in showing that, and I show it to my students, is we oftentimes skip one of the most fundamental parts of how our identities are shaped, and that is by the community in which we live. We do a good job, at least at FOCJ and other institutions of higher learning, of teaching Florida history and American history and global history, but not so much with local history. And so that was a kind of visualization that I've already in some ways addressed. So let me go back now and say, what are the goals for this course? I'm going to only touch on three. There are others. But if the reputation of Jacksonville is a city bereft of history, one of the goals, of course, is that we want to change that narrative. And to do that, we want to ask a fundamental question. What makes Jacksonville unique? Now, if I ask you, and maybe someone will feel free to give out their answer, if you had to think about Jacksonville, whether it's culture or it's history, what makes us distinct as a place? What might you say? And I'm thinking here of something other than, oh, we used to have this really cool club down here at the beach called Einstein and Go Go. It was located on the ocean. It was rare and only one of its kind. Bands always remark, we've never played anywhere where the ocean was just over the street, on the street, just behind the club or that we have this really cool restaurant in Mayport, it's called Singleton, it's <laughs> in South Dakota. I'm thinking here of something deeper than that. What makes Jacksonville unique? What distinguishes it from Savannah, or Charleston, or Tallahassee? Well, I won't hold you to anything right now, but this is one of the questions we are asking in the course, and you can answer that question in a number of different ways. There is no one single solitary answer, but one of the things I'm gonna to try to do in this course, and have started to try to do, is to give a theory of Jacksonville history. What is a unifying theme we see throughout almost more than 2,000 years of human habitation. Of course, there have been humans here in Northeast Florida much longer than that, but what I am arguing in this course is one of the reasons it's oftentimes hard to understand Jacksonville's history and its identity is that we are a place that is sort of stuck in between. We are a borderland, sometimes called a transition zone. Well, what is a borderland? It's kind of an abstract concept, and to bring it home, I'm going to give you a couple of examples from Jacksonville history by what I mean by a borderland. On the one hand here, it's obvious. We have a lot of rivers coursing through our region. We have the St. Mary's, which is now the border between Georgia and Florida, the St. John's, and the St. Mary's River, even the Nassau River, if you go back over the history of human, um, not just human habitation, but also European colonization, these rivers were boundaries between imperial powers. We were in an area where European powers, the Spanish, particularly, and the English, fought for control of land here in Northeast Florida. And Northeast Florida was a very violent, volatile area. Borderlands tend to be that. But borderlands are often places of rich cultural diversity. Borderlands have a unique mix of people who come from very different places and oftentimes create new identities and reinvent themselves in these places. And so one of the reasons I think we've struggled to understand what makes Jacksonville unique and to appreciate its history is that on the one hand, while we are located in the American South, we are not like other cities and other areas of the Deep South. We are not a carbon copy, clearly, of Savannah or Charleston. We're in the South, but not always of the cultural South. Another way to say it is that we are also, of course, in Florida, but Jacksonville and North Florida, Northeast Florida, oftentimes seen itself as distinct from the rest of Florida. It's, it's sort of, we're not like Miami and Fort Lauderdale and Palm Beach. 
But that notion of a borderland or a transition zone has some very specific historical examples that I can give you that will um, bring this to life. And again, I could have chosen a number of examples, but I'm just going to focus on a couple here. Okay, well, one, really quick, bringing this back to our um, indigenous history, if you go back more almost a thousand years, um, if you know about indigenous history, you know in the middle part of the country, um, we see the growth of one of the most powerful indigenous societies and civilizations, the Mississippian Indian Society, that stretched from the Mississippi River all the way into southeast Georgia, and beyond this boundary, of course, you had the St. John's or the Tamukula people. And so we were a kind of border between indigenous civilizations. And I give many, many examples of this um, throughout the course. But in another more recent phenomenon, I'm going to use the Civil War as an example. Many of you, perhaps, in studying the Civil War, knowing anything about the Civil War, know what the Mason-Dixon line is. The Mason-Dixon line, of course, was a line that initially separated Maryland and Pennsylvania. It was created in the 18th century, but then as the nation moved westward, it followed the Ohio River, and the Mason-Dixon line becomes the border between slave states in the South free states in the North. In keeping with this idea about what makes Jacksonville unique, I tell my students when we learn about the Civil War that Jacksonville had a Mason-Dixon line running through it. It was, in many ways, a city that was a microcosm of the nation during the war. It's too simplistic to say Jacksonville was only a Southern or Confederate city. It was a city of incredible diversity that in fact had its own version of a Mason-Dixon line running through it. So what were the consequences, for instance, for Jacksonville during this time? And this is what I tell my students. So, whoops, let me go back. So the Mason-Dixon line in Jacksonville, well, what does that look like in a real sense? Well, here are all of the Jacksonville mayors just before and after the Civil War. And this is remarkable because you would see this in no other city in the Deep South. If you look at this, look at the mayors and where they are from, it's almost as if Jacksonville had established a law that Jacksonville would have a mayor from the north, and then after he finished office, there would be a mayor from the south. And, well, why was this the case? How do you have a succession of mayors from the north and from the south? This is a time of deep sectional tension where the nation is debating questions about the extension of slavery into the West. Will the nation be all slave or all free? Can it survive a house divided against itself? The nation was literally on the brink of war, and here in Jacksonville, there seems to be um, some degree of peace between Northerners and Southerners. Well, just before the Civil War in Jacksonville, more than 45% of the heads of households, which oftentimes were men, more than 45%, or about 45%, were born in the North. That was remarkable cultural distinction that Jacksonville had. It had a sizable Northern-born population. And so, well, what does this mean then when the Civil War breaks out in Jacksonville? What were those Northern-born residents going to do? Were they going to remain loyal to the United States, or were they going to begin to turn and begin to be loyal to their new home here in the South, to the Confederacy. Well, what happens here in Jacksonville in March of 1862, oops, is that if you know about Jacksonville during the Civil War in March of 1862, Jacksonville is about to be occupied by the Union um, military for the very first time. And on March 11, 1862, one of the most remarkable days in Jacksonville history that reveals why Jacksonville was this unique borderland community. As the Navy was preparing to come in and occupy Jacksonville, they began to see the night before flames coming up from the city. Jacksonville was on fire. Why was it on fire? It wasn't anything the Union military had done. Jacksonville was at war with itself. 
Many of the Confederate partisans in Jacksonville believed that all of these northern-born people were no longer going to be loyal to them, but now to this potential invading enemy, to the United States, and began to mark northerners for death, including people who were once their mayors, including people who had businesses they patronized, including people who they thought were their friends. And what happened was that four people in Jacksonville on this night of March 11, 1862, were murdered. And the New York paper, the New York Tribune, that came in with the Occupying Union military wrote that Jacksonville residents feared nothing as much as their own people. The fact that the Union military was going to occupy Jacksonville was not the source of fear. The source of fear in Jacksonville were former friends and former neighbors who now in the case of Calvin Robinson, one of the major business owners along Bay Street, a man from Vermont, his businesses were all set aflame and burned to the ground. Otis Keene, a man from Maine who owned the biggest hotel in Jacksonville, the Judson House, he too saw his business burned to the ground simply because he was from the North and did not have sufficient loyalty to the Confederacy. And so here in Jacksonville, then, is the byproduct of this sectional tension, symbol of which was the Mason-Dixon line, separating free states from slave states, north from south. Jacksonville had that within it, and no other city experienced such internal, internecine conflict. And that is one way I teach my students to say, this is what is unique about Jacksonville. This is something that, because of the cultural makeup, you might not have seen in other places. Now, this idea of a borderland community extends up to the present day. So I went back and showed you an image of the boundary between where the Tamuqua have their civilization, where the Mississippian peoples have their civilization. I've shown you how there was this sort of metaphorical Mason-Dixon line running through Jacksonville during the Civil War. Jacksonville in Northeast Florida today, according to geographers, is also a borderland when thinking about geographic and cultural regions. So this is perhaps a little confusing to look at, so let me explain it very quickly. I'm going from the Civil War up through the 20th and 21st century and shifting about talking now, how is Northeast Florida conceived? Is it part of the South? Is it part of cultural Dixie? Or is it something else? Well, cultural geographers beginning in the 1970s and 1980s began to draw lines that demarcated where the cultural South Ends. Not the geographic South, but the cultural South, where people have Southern culture, where they speak with Southern accents. And what I've found fascinating through all my research is that once again, Jacksonville in Northeast Florida is a kind of borderland. And so these markers are basically waves that geographers say, when you go south of this line, you are no longer in the cultural South. You have gone into Florida. You've gone into, as the old saying goes, the further south you go to Florida, the more northern you get, the further north, the more southern you get. And so this was a way for cultural geographers to say, well, where exactly does that happen? And for us, it's just about a 10 minute drive south on A1A, and you are out of the cultural south. I think if we had 21st century geographers mapping where the south is, that line probably is beginning to creep up more and more. Um, but this was another kind of fascinating thing, and it gets back to this question. What is our identity? What makes us unique? What makes our history unique? Well, when you are in this kind of border region, when you embrace different facets of, yes, the Deep South, and yes, of Florida, and of the North, and internationally, sometimes it can be very difficult to kind of figure out what makes our community unique. And so that is one of the driving questions um, of this class. All right, the other goal of this class, oh, just by the way, one more of those sort of borderland <laughs> images. Where is the native southern accent? Um, this is from 1995, and by native, that means if you grew up here, you would have an accent, not that people move into an area with an accent, you can hear a southern accent. That is, you are from here, you live here, where do you hear a native southern accent? Um, so this is in 1995, and basically, again, the cutoff is in St. John's County. 
Um, I've seen other maps that have become so precise. Linguists say the southern accent ends when you move east of the St. Johns River. You go west of the St. Johns River. There is still the vestige of a southern accent. But in northeast Florida, linguists now say it's basically gone. Um, that is one theory, according to some of the linguists. But nevertheless, what I find interesting here is, again, we are kind of in this border transition zone. Um, OK, the second goal of this class, and I don't have an image for it, is something that we really want to emphasize to students and also emphasize to community members who take it. We believe a course like this can instill civic pride, a sense of place, a sense of belonging, but also civic engagement. That you not only take an appreciation for the history of where you're from, you create a new sense of self and identity where you live, but with that when you appreciate an area's history, you have a deeper sense of its well-being, preserving its well-being. And as you read about other local history, um, courses that have been offered across the country or people who do local history, there's often this very firm insistence that knowledge of local history goes hand in hand with civic engagement and civic well-being. John Archibald, a local historian who worked in St. Louis for many years, said this, I speculate that if I could find the formula, I could equate the loss of historical awareness with the decline in civic engagement that sense of common purpose that compels us to consider the common welfare. And to that end, what we're doing in this course, beginning in the fall, is I am hosting a special, and for lack of a better word, I'm calling it a VIP section of the course. And this is what the college really finds to be important. This isn't just a course for students to take to learn and appreciate Jacksonville history. We want this course to establish community partnerships so that students can begin working with nonprofits, with museums, with city <coughs> government, and in, um, sections of city government like the Historic Preservation Unit that does historical work. Um, we want there to be a partnership so that students take what they're learning in the classroom and apply it into the community. And so in the fall, in this special course, I'm going to have um, students who are not degree-seeking students, but who work for museums across the city, um, who work for the city of Jacksonville. We're going to have um, journalists from the Times Union taking the course. Um, it's just really remarkable group of people in establishing those bonds that we hope will begin to generate conversations and relationships that will allow students to not only apply what they learn, but to begin develop a deeper appreciation for their own community's well-being. And then last, the goal for this course, before I move and talk about some of our archival finds, and I'm very sorry this is, oh, real quick, I, I keep forgetting I have an extra example. Um, many of you might be familiar with Gullah Geechee culture, um, a distinct African-American culture that developed particularly in the Sea Islands and coastal regions of the Southeast. Um, this is the Gullah Geechee Cultural Heritage Corridor. Where does it end? It ends at the Duval County, St. John's County border. So yet again, another example of how we are a transition zone. We see this in a lot of different ways and here a distinct African-American cultural tradition um, Jacksonville, for a very long time, because of in-migration, had the largest Gullah Geechee population in the United States. We'd oftentimes associate that with Savannah or Charleston, when in fact it was Jacksonville. Um, and that is testified to here with where the cultural corridor is located. All right. Um, so the third goal here is I want students to not only leave this class having a deeper appreciation for the vitality and the richness of Jacksonville history, about what makes us unique, and about ways in which they can apply that learning in the community, I want students to leave the class with a deeper appreciation for the craft of history. Now, many of you perhaps have had history classes, and it might have been a while, but you can remember that history, more often than not, was taught as kind of a rote memorization process. You learn names, dates, and facts. You spin them back on an exam, and you hope to memorize them well enough to get a passing grade. 
history for many students, and we see this not only in studies, but in anecdotes I hear from students when they come into my classes, history ranks near the bottom of graduating seniors' favorite courses. They tend to not only not do well in history, but have a deep dislike of history, and more often than not, it's because of how history has been taught. And I'll get right to that. You can hold that question for the end. Uh, in addition to that, students are growing up in an age when history has become a front in our unending, and oftentimes inane, culture wars. And I say this because I don't care where you stand on the political spectrum. It is a tragedy, in my mind, that history has become a source of division and controversy. And it's stripped it of its richness. Its fascination for students has kind of fallen away because it's become a bugaboo, or it is something that they just have no interest in because of how it's taught. So I want them to leave this class with a new appreciation for history as a vital intellectual and creative enterprise. And we're going to do this in a lot of different ways in the class. Um, students in my class are going to be doing original research. They're going to be going to archives, both here in town um, and online. They are going to be creating works of scholarship that we have created a journal at FSCJ called Moss Culture. It's a play on mass culture, Moss, Spanish Moss <laughs> Culture, the culture of Jacksonville. Um, and we are publishing student work. So students are going to be published authors. They're learning about the methodologies, um, the practices, the skills of being a professional historian. Professional historians don't memorize names, dates, and facts. They gather evidence, become masters of vast literatures, of both secondary and primary sources. And then they use creativity um, to interpret those sources and to draw out their deeper meanings. And this is what we want students to do. And we believe that the way to develop a deep, lifelong appreciation for history is to connect students at the local level. When you connect them with something tangible, when you can bring them out in the community as we do in our courses and to visit historic sites, your brain literally changes. The hippocampus fires up all of these cells that allow you to learn in ways at a deeper level than if you're sitting in your room reading an old-fashioned textbook. And so actually getting students out into the community not only helps them establish those ties, but we hope helps them appreciate history from a very different perspective. And so then when they take an American history class or a world history class, they're thinking of history in a very different all right, um, as I said, our students are using a lot of different kind of archives. Um, just this past year, I've had students write some fascinating essays um, that got them out in the community doing oral histories, going to the Jacksonville Historical Society, going to the Jacksonville Public Library, hopefully sending students here to the Beaches Museum in the future. Um, so let me talk about some of the other ways we have been using archives in this class. Um, that's the archive that's there. Exactly. Okay. Well, that. okay, real quick, um, one of the ways I have been emphasizing the immediacy of local <laughs> history to students, and one of the ways they have responded, this is, you can almost see their minds breaking through this glass, and they're feeling and experiencing history in a radically different way, is for instance, when we talk about the history of segregation, it's one thing for students to read about segregation at a downtown store or aboard a bus, something that they perhaps have read a lot about in the past. But when they read, and this is new to almost all of my students, that beaches in the South and in Jacksonville were segregated up until 1964, my students are shocked. And this is one of the ways we are able to draw on the work of other local historians, including one who was once employed, associate director here at the Beaches Museum. Museum, Brittany Cohill um, did a remarkable exhibit that was here at the Beaches Museum about Manhattan Beach, um, which is now in Hanna Park. And students now will go and visit. I oftentimes tell them there's a brand new historic marker there that was recently put up a couple of years ago. But examples like this, drawing from the work of archives, including the Beaches Museum, um, showing what historians, Brittany Cohill is a master's student at UNF when she did her project, but getting students to realize they can do this too. 
um, totally transforms their understanding of local history and what historians are capable of doing. And as one of my students sent me, it sends them down rabbit holes. When they learn about this, they want to do their own research. They go and find and bring me newspaper articles that I did not know about, including this one from 1956 um, from the Tampa Tribune. All right, so what were some of the other archival finds that not only my students in this particular case, but we have found um, in doing this course? So one of the things that we recognized when developing this course is that once we were at the stage of doing research to gather materials for the course, the pandemic hit. And that meant we were basically shut off from using local archives to find our materials. And therefore, we had to, you know, necessity being the mother invention, we began to scour online archive and online sources for materials. And that allowed us to find things we perhaps might not otherwise have found. And I'm gonna give you just a few examples and, and a couple here as we finish up are gonna involve some silent film clips. But in the course of researching the history of film in Jacksonville, we found something that was remarkable for a reason that is not directly connected to the history we thought we were exploring. Jacksonville, as you perhaps well know, by 1909 up through about the 1920s, was one of the centers of filmmaking in the United States before that energy and focus shifted west to Los Angeles. Jacksonville, we thought that was all Jacksonville's history film history involved. But in the course of doing research, we realized Jacksonville was not only one of the first film centers in America, we discovered that Jacksonville had another distinct notoriety. We learned that in 1898, Jacksonville was the site of the very first place where a man chose to videotape an execution. The first film shot in Jacksonville was not a fictional film. The first film shot in Jacksonville was in 1898 and was of a public painting. Now, what this did is that when we discovered this, we immediately began to say, does this film exist? Is this film footage still around? And in the course of doing this research, we found a couple of things. One, the film footage apparently does still exist. But when we were doing research, we discovered that it had recently been sold at auction. This is very quickly. Um, the film, as I'm gonna explain in just a minute, was made by a man named Arthur Marvin, who was associated with the American Mutoscope and Biograph Company. Arthur Marvin was here in Jacksonville in 1898 because the Spanish-American War was about to begin. Jacksonville was a place, as well as Tampa and the Keys, where soldiers from across the country came and were stationed before going to Cuba. And so in July of 1898, you had a lot of soldiers from all across the country who were prepared to go to Cuba. And Arthur Marvin was there because he thought he was going with them and he was gonna, for the first time in American history, film war. But before they went to Cuba, Arthur Marvin learned that there was to be a public execution in Jacksonville. He spoke with the sheriff and the sheriff allowed him in the jail yard, and Arthur Marvin did the very first in American history. He recorded a public execution. And the video that was shot in Jacksonville was shown in theaters for years all across the country. And therefore, we know something about it. And so even though the film, as I'll explain in just a minute, we thought was lost, we were able to find some stills. But we learned that the film was not lost, but instead, had been sold recently at auction for $4,320 to a private buyer. And so what we are trying to do now, and if you have any connections to the film world in Chicago, or if you know anyone who might have the money to buy um, footage of this historical importance, please let us know, because we are really diligently trying to track this down. The fact that someone would simply buy this and hold it privately and not donate it to an archive um, is something we find troubling, but for Jacksonville history, it's also very, very important. So, in the course of doing this, though, we discovered something else, and that was that it wasn't just Arthur Marvin that day in Jacksonville filming the first public execution ever in world history. 
we discovered that one of the soldiers, a soldier with the Wisconsin Regiment, was also there to witness this event. And he had a camera. And he was standing very close to where Arthur Marvin was and took multiple pictures of this. Now, how did we learn this? In the course of then learning more about this event in Jacksonville, we read multiple newspaper accounts. And my co-creator of this course, the FSCJ archivist Jennifer Gray, discovered in one of the newspaper accounts there was a man named Tony Palika from Wisconsin, associated with the Wisconsin Regiment, who was taking pictures very close to where Arthur Marvin was filming this execution. And Jennifer said, from this 1898 article, I wonder if we can find an archive, maybe in Wisconsin, that would have the photographs taken by this Wisconsin soldier. Jennifer went online and found that Wisconsin has this remarkable veterans museum, where it has all the artifacts and materials of veterans of foreign wars um, who came from Wisconsin. And so she sent an email to this archive in Wisconsin and saying, hey, this is a little bit of a long shot, but we have this line from an 1898 newspaper that a Wisconsin soldier took photographs in Jacksonville in July of 1898 of an execution. Do you happen to have these? She sends back an email and says, we do. Do you want us to digitize them? It was the quintessential example of a needle in a haystack. And as a historian, those never come true. And in this case, it did. I'm going to show you this briefly because for some, this can be a little unsettling. It's not of the death itself, do not worry. But this is a case that involved a black man being falsely accused of assaulting a white girl. He was quickly charged without any evidence and to prevent a lynching, an extra legal form of violence, the Duval County Court rapidly facilitated his public execution. And so this has historical importance for a variety of reasons. And so this is the, one of the photos the Wisconsin Archives sent back to me. There is a Catholic priest who is reading his last rites. This man, Edward Henson, a 21-year-old man, um, said, I am innocent, but I have, no, I have no anger in my heart. I forgive. And then after, soon after this, um, is when the execution happens. And what is interesting is we now know the photographer was here and Arthur Marvin would have been just to his right doing something that had never been done before. Do we know where, what part of Jacksonville So this was the Jacksonville jail that I think was along Liberty Street. Okay. And this is the Jacksonville jail. And if you can see at the very top, you see that scraggly mm -hmm. um, stuff that's coming out of the building. Those are actually glass bottles that the police put up so the prisoners would not try to scale the wall and escape. Um, and so we learned that as well from the people who were there that day witnessing this event. Now, again, this has so many layers to it. There's the history of public execution and the death penalty in Florida. There's the history of race and Jim Crow. There's the history of the Spanish-American War. All of that rushes into this very one moment here in Jacksonville's history. So while we were searching for one thing, the history of the film industry in Jacksonville, we discovered something extraordinary that no, no one has ever touched. And so where we go with this material, we have yet to decide. But it's an example of the many things we uncovered in the course of preparing for this class. All right, so on a somewhat lighter topic, I'm going to finish up our talk tonight by showing a few um, silent film Clips. Jacksonville was indeed the center of filmmaking um, in the nation before that industry moved west to Hollywood. But why was Jacksonville the center of filmmaking in the early 20th century? In many ways, it had to do with our landscape. It had to do with us being a city that was the river city by the sea. You had a beautiful wide river, you had easy access to the coast. You had really fascinating tropical vegetation like palm trees and oaks with moss draping down. It was a visual feast for the eyes of filmmakers. And so what I'm going to do now is to show you one of the things we did, and Jennifer Gray deserves the credit for this. She scoured all of the silent films she could find. 
and began to label which ones were made in Jacksonville, something that really nobody had done with the depth until Jennifer did this. And she's discovered other silent films that have never been digitized, that are now getting digitized, that were made here in Jacksonville, and students are now writing essays based on this archival work. The ones I'm going to show you now, Captain Kate and a film called Rastus Among the Zulus, were shot here in what was then known as Pablo Beach. Pablo Beach, Jacksonville Beach, was a film site because for filmmakers, they thought this is the best and the closest we're going to get to a film set in Africa. And so Pablo Beach became Africa in the minds of filmmakers here um, in Northeast Florida. And so I'm going to have to scoot over here and play. Oops. I don't know. Is Chris around? I might need some technical help. We need it. It's 19. I hear the deal. I hear the deal. I hear the deal. I the I Went to, um, he graduated from Manhattan High School. Oh, okay. Is the one that you were playing with there? Oh, this one's nice. The others are not. So this is a great place for history. Pardon me? Oh, yeah. Okay, well, I'll just talk it off. Okay, well, um, I thought embedding these videos in my PowerPoint would work, but in both Captain Kate and Rastus Among the Zulus, um, I was going to show you footage of Pablo Beach in 1911 and 1913 when those two films were made, to give you a sense of how film companies used the beaches and to see the look of Jacksonville Beach back in the early 20th century is extraordinary. It looks, of course, um, more like an abandoned part of Florida than, than it does today. Um, but I will say, this is one of the filmmakers, um, the man who wrote the script for the Rastus Among the Zulus. Um, this is what he said about Pablo Beach. His name was X. Winworth Sargent. He said, the script we wrote was done after we had gone over the ground with the director. In other words, we wrote this script because of the landscape of Pablo Beach. We took the 20-mile run from Jacksonville to Pablo Beach and then down the beach, cutting inland here and there to get an idea of the country that was to be used for the jungle spot. <clears throat> we noted that there were no boats at the beach, which is unprotected from high surf, no inlets of consequence, and no thick undergrowth. We knew that such a script was wanted and would be purchased. And so here was one of the script writers of one of these films saying it was the landscape of Pablo Beach that inspired this film that we then made and became wildly popular. These African films that were made here in Northeast Florida were some of the most popular and the highest grossing at the time. And I'm sorry they are not showing up here. Um, two more examples, one of which I think is going to work. Um, one of the other things we did during the pandemic was work with the Florida archives. And we discovered on the Florida archives that they had a lot of film related to Jacksonville that had not been digitized and that had no metadata. That is, it had no indication of what was actually on the film other than that it seemed to be there were films about Jacksonville on the video, but it was no use to historians. And so Jennifer not only got the Florida archives to digitize this footage, but to put metadata on it so historians could know what they were looking for and use it appropriately. So this is benefiting not only us, but we hope for other scholars in the future. And one of them we found was a 1939 National Guard training video that features footage from Jacksonville Beach, the National Guard in Jacksonville Beach in 1939. And this was playing for Chris. I feel like now I'm... There we go. So here is a brief clip of this film footage we 
got the Florida archives to digitize. Along the boardwalk. <laughs> As a surfer, I always look at all these old photographs and I'm looking at the waves in the background and looking at the sandbars and seeing to have better waves back then. Um, another thing we did, I'm going to finish with this. So this is more recent. This is now 1960. 1960, if you know about Jacksonville history, was a major turning point in the city's history. In August of 1960, August 27th to be exact, was Axe Handle Saturday. Um, an event that happened in Jacksonville that grew out of the protest against segregated restaurants and lunch counters downtown. In response, segregationists, including Klansmen, brought axe handles, not the axes and the blades themselves, but axe handles, um, and began to beat anyone associated with the sit-ins and then anyone black in the streets of downtown Jacksonville. This became national news. It was featured in Life magazine. And a lot of people, if they know anything about Jacksonville history, will sometimes point to Axe Handle Saturday. But there is surprisingly not a lot of actual deep research on Axe Handle Saturday, not in print media or in film. It was a widely filmed event Journalists with the Times Union had filmed until the people with the axe handles saw them and beat them while they were trying to film the event. Um, journalists with Reuters, the news distribution <coughs> service, were in Jacksonville and were there to film it. And some of that footage has been featured in documentaries, but Jennifer, who deserves the credit for this, found extensive footage of Axe Handle Saturday that was not previously known. Um, and in addition to that, found other sources that were actually just posted when we were doing this research on a major kind of research site called archive.org that was only labeled New Station, Jacksonville, Florida, 1960. There was no data, there was no indication of what was in it, but Jennifer went through this long video that was a summary of the news in Jacksonville in 1960. And in that summary of the news in Jacksonville of 1960, there was this new footage of Axe Handle Saturday. Um, in addition to that, we discovered some fascinating looks at Jacksonville in 1960 related to the beaches and to its military history. And so I'm going to play this now, and then I'm going to finish with one other short clip. So this is a ship, it's been out to sea with the Navy, it's coming back into yeah. Mayport. Um, the audio cuts out, sorry about that. This is 1960, this is the summer of 1960. What, is Gear Group carrying Saratoga? Or That's a good question, I don't know which, which carrier this would have been. But this is something we are showing to students. It's only 27 minutes. It's a history of Jacksonville um, in 1960. This is the Marine. Their Marines are at Blunt Island, and they are practicing invasions. And you might have seen there, and I'll call this to your attention again in just a minute. Um, so this is just a couple of months before Axe Handle Saturday, the footage we were actually looking for. Um, but in the course of that search, found Again, many other things related to local history. So, what my students say, what I try to point out is, well, isn't this fascinating imagery? What, what did you notice as you were looking yeah. at this film? <laughs> Why would the Marines practicing amphibious landings at Blunt Island be flying a Confederate battle flag in 1960? War game. Okay, so is that, so they match, that could possibly be, um, but the Confederate battle flag was everywhere in popular culture. People were, on the one hand, anticipating the next year, the centennial of the Civil War. But there's also something else going on, of course, that is the Civil Rights Movement. 
And so when we then pair that, and I show my students this footage that we found, and then we say, okay, well, what else is going on? Um, I show them this footage. It's Axe Handle Saturday. You might have seen it just very briefly. The men carrying axe handles down the street put Confederate battle flags on the axes that they then were beating people with downtown. And so here you have one footage of an amphibious training exercise at Blunt Island with the United States Marines flying the Confederate battle flag. And then you move into the next story and you have men walking down the street of Jacksonville in 1960 with Confederate battle flags attached to axes, axe handles that they then used to beat people with on the streets that day, August of 1960. And so what this has done for us is that we have been tapping into archives that online that were accessible to the public and not really utilized in ways that had any effectiveness for anyone doing research. If it wasn't for Jennifer doing this work and bringing them out, forcing the Florida Archive to put metadata on them, to digitize them, um, we would not have much of the footage that I just showed you. And then applying that in the classroom, it awakens students in ways that simply a lecture or reading can't. Um, so for instance, and this is where I'm finishing, if I'm talking about Axe Handle Saturday, let's put that into context. Let's look at a portrait of Jacksonville, not just on August 27, 1960, but throughout 1960, um, to make connections between seemingly disparate events. And just that example of the Confederate battle flag is one way um, and I'm not implying here that the Marines would therefore have been the people who were down the street of Jacksonville with axe handles. But I am suggesting in the context of 1960 that symbolism had a particular resonance and meaning. And if you look at those in isolation, they don't have as much significance as if you look at them together. And again, this is just one example of the fruits of the research for this class and that I hope students will take with them and develop a new appreciation for history, and that I hope this sounds interesting, you will want to take the class with me at some point in the future, and if you do, here is how to reach out to me. Um, I'm sorry if this is difficult to see. If you want to come up later and take a picture, um, you can get my email address, but I will be happy to talk with you at any point. Um, and again, this is not a one-time thing. This will be offered, I hope, for years to come, and um, if you're ever interested, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you all very much. Any questions? I have one. Did you say if it's in class or online? It's going to be offered both. I am offering it both as an in-class option and online, although this fall it is only in-class, but in spring it will be online, and we're going to try to always have two versions for students who would prefer to take it on their own time online rather than having to come into class. So by spring, it's a... Yes, by spring there will be an online version that you can register for if that's what you choose to do. Yes. So if you're auditing the class, you just show up and absorb. Absolutely, you do as much as you want. You can take a test if you want to. You can write an essay if you want to. Um, it's your investment, so you you, you choose your own path. And how many weeks do you teach this? That is a 15-week semester. So, for instance, this year we go from August 29th through December 10th, I think. And then in January, I think, I don't remember when we start in January, but it's, it's another 15-week course. How many sections? How many sections? Well, generally, there will be at least two. Okay. Yeah, and, and by the spring, there will be both an in-person option and an online option, although in the fall, there's only an in-person. So is this a, this is a regular course, or do you also have like a community uh, education kind of thing? This is so the community education course at FSCJ. Yeah. yeah. So this is this right now is not directly connected to the community education program, but we're going to hopefully use that as well. Yeah.
It will, it, will, it will sometimes be downtown, it will sometimes be south, it will not just be in one location. Yeah. So I would invite you all to hang out a little while. Please do take a look at the exhibit. Um, Scott, do you have a few minutes to hang Absolutely. out and answer any questions? Yep. And you all have your cameras out taking photos of Scott's contact information, so keep them out. Scan those QR codes. Our lovely volunteers are holding them as you leave. Um, we would love to hear what you thought about this um, and future lectures. And we thank you all again so much for coming out tonight. And we really appreciate your interest in our area's history. So have a great night. Thank you, Scott. And there's more snacks. Please feel free.